Hey everyone, my name is David Hill. I'm the manager of the PIP program here at DHS. Today is going to be our PIP boot camp where we give you guys a course on how to do the application, all the basics and highlights. So welcome aboard and let's get started. DHS has different performance improvement programs. Of course, PIP, the Performance Based Incentive Payment Program, is why you're here today. This provides resources up front for quality improvement activities. We also have the QIP, which is the Quality Improvement Incentive Payment Program, and that rewards quality improvement with a bonus up to $3.50. And you'll see that on your rate as well. Now, the QIP and PIP, I have an arrow in the middle, meaning that they can work together. So if you're going to apply for a PIP, you can also choose that same measure for your QIP. Just another way to, uh, you know, give you an extra bonus or extra, you know, money you're going to be putting towards something that can actually help you. So those are great programs we offer here at Minnesota. Another thing is that 95% of facilities operating in Minnesota today have had at least one PIP project, and that's just wonderful percentage. So thanks for all your support through the years. Proposals are funded at a rate not to exceed 5% of the daily operating rate. So keep that in mind. On January 1, make sure your percentage does not go over 5%. Now, this comes up sometimes for two-year projects. If somebody already has on year two, for example, a you know 2% rate increase, the max they can get is three, you know, because we just can't go over five. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your uh, math for what you need. The entire payment, incentive payments at risk, Prorated up to 100%. This is new as well. We did this in 2022. Um, and so if you get 60% of your goal, you keep 60% of your funds. So if you hit 100% of your goal, you keep all the funds. So it, it's more of a risk on this. So, you know, do that accordingly when you do your budget. You know, you may not need a full 5% if you want to risk that much. An Excel spreadsheet budget is not required for proposals. It was more difficult for facilities because things would change on that budget and you'd have to get a hold of us and see if it was okay. Now, really, you're in the trenches. You know what you need. If something changed on what you wanted to buy, go ahead and do that to achieve your goal. Uh, you have your money, you have your measure, and you have your goal to hit, and, and you can do that. So just hit that. But we do have a budget template available for your internal use only. At the end of this video, there's a little bonus if you'd like to learn how to use that. Uh, and it's just uh, available for collaboratives and facilities if you would like to, if it would help you organize your money and what you need for your uh, PIP. And reminder, a goal of PIP is dissemination. Strategies and outcomes are expected to be shared throughout the industry. W what's working? Um, if we try a new software, a new uh, some kind of a thing that you've done or something that worked, let, let's share that with each other, other states, other people. So that's kind of the idea we want to do through PIP is learn from each other and share what's working and what's not working and, and get better at what we do. PIP proposals for round 18 are due by midnight on May 1st, 2024. I get asked a lot if they get uh, different scoring by who gets them in first, second, or third, and that's not true. We just get them in and pass them on to the PIP committee once they're all received. So just get it in by this time and you'll be uh, on the list. At this point in time, I'm gonna pass this on to Kim Class. Hello, my name is Kim Class, and I oversee the PIP program. I'm going to explain how to complete the RFP fillable form and give a brief overview of DHS's quality data used for PIP, QIP, and the nursing home report card. Instructions for writing the PIP proposal. First thing to do is to read the request for proposal. That's very important. It has a lot of information in there um, about how PIP works, who qualifies for PIP, how much funding you can um, receive, and then also um, the timelines, which are going to be really important too. And then the next thing is to read the instructions for writing the PIP proposal. So everything that I'm going to go over on these slides, you'll find in the instructions. So each one of these sections, there's an example um, in um, in the instructions that show you what should go in there and and how it should be written. And what's great now is is that we only have um, eight sections to complete, which goes pretty quick now. And, and the other thing too I was going to say about the instructions is it also holds in the back there's some appendages that'll be really easy I mean really good to look at too gives you some tips for um, the selection process gives you the tips on resources and then um, how to write it so it, it'll it's worth your time to take a look at that 
So now we'll move on. Next slide. So sections one and two is pretty self-explanatory. We're looking for the contact information um, for the facility. Um, that's important too, to make sure we include um, email addresses, especially for collaboratives. So, so um, the facilities that are joining in the collaborative need to include their um, email addresses uh, because we will be using that to contact them um, when, we're, when we start the reporting process. In section two, we want you to pro provide a brief overview of the facility. So where are the facilities located, um, the population, um, you know, anything that is unique about your facility, I include those in the description so we can kind of get a feel for what your facility is like. Collaborative projects, we want to make sure that you decide, you describe a clear plan of the collaborative leadership and the expectations from the members of the collaboratives. That will be very helpful. And we'll go on to section three. Section three is just the intro, um, briefly describing the problem and how the project will improve the quality of care and quality of life of the nursing home residents. So this is a brief description of the problem and what is the facility plan to do? So making sure that the proposals address those topics where facilities baseline um, data supports that problem area. So section four, this is where we identify the problems. This is a really important part of the RFP. So you want to provide a detailed description of the problem you want to solve or need to improve. And then I will give you some examples of where to find that. You can look at the Minnesota um, report card or you can go on DHS's provider portal um, to look at the data in there. It's, it's important that we use data that's measurable. So when you're looking at problems and um, and you think, well, it's, it's not really listed in any of the DHS data, you have to make sure that you present um, those measures um, in a valid, reliable way. So say I want to do something like one thing you want to avoid is, is like saying things like, well, I'm going to make sure that um, I have 80% of my staff are educated or um, something that it's not measurable. We do, however, allow for self-reporting of falls. Um, that's important too because the DHS data only uses the falls with injury. And so that's something that we self-support. We try to stay away from um, medication too, um, where people say they want to decrease the amount of medications residents are receiving. That's a harder one too. Or antibiotic usage. Um, it's harder for us to track that um, and we have in the past um, allowed those and it gets really messy. Um, so we kind of like you to focus on something that's really clear and that the data can be found um, the, publicly. And you know one of the places you can look to is this, you know you can look at CMS's compare to and, and use stuff off of there. We have a facility that's doing that too. So and the, and the other thing too is is make sure that you know, you're doing a really good root cause analysis when you're looking at these problems and that you bullet, bullet point those issues. Um, and if you, this section, if you fail to identify those problems, it's going to be really hard. Um, you're going to struggle with completing um, the following sections. So the advantage of the R, uh, of the recause analysis for PIP is it allows more in-depth discovery of why the project is needed. Identifying those causes of those problems will provide insight on areas for improvement to strengthen um, the need for the project. Finding um, the findings will help determine those strategies and resources you're going to need, and then a strong RCA provides the building blocks for the successful completion of sections five and eight. So identifying those problem areas, you know, looking at your audits, you know, where those um, you, you see a problem, you know, start auditing it, see what those audits are saying. Looking at systems is really important because most of the time it's a system breakdown. Um, that's that's causing the problem. You want to make sure you're interviewing staff, residents and family members to gather as much information as you can um, that will make it uh, that'll provide for a stronger proposal. 
So section five of the project proposal. This is where we're going to write a description of the proposed project um, that is going to address those problems in section four. And then keeping in mind that there is no itemized budget um, and that this section should build the case for the rate increase in section eight. So you're going to have to put in here what are those strategies that you're going to use and what are those resources going to be and then um, putting in here too of how you're going to collect and evaluate and then also strategies to sustain your project. Since it's different now when we're not asking for a work plan anymore, we still need to have an idea of what you're going to do. You may change that as you move through and in this is to allow you to be more flexible. Uh, that's why we changed how we're going, how we want PIP to be. We want facilities to have the flexibility to change um, a strategy or change a consultant without coming to us and asking, you know, is it OK if we do that? However, I want to caution facilities that when you're doing these projects, even though we're not asking for the work plan and we're not asking for the budget, you are still going to be it's going to be up to you to track education who who attends the education, any things that is purchased, um, any consultants that are used. Because in the end, if you don't make the goal or say the project stops um, for some reason, we stop it um, and we ask for a desk audit. Um, we will, you know, to be able to take into the expenditures that you spent on the project. We need to have documentation for that. You also need to keep that documentation for audit purposes. If the project is ever audited, you're going to have to be able to show where that money went. So that's why it's important to keep in mind, even though we're not asking for that budget, we're not asking you to give us receipts. You need to track it for yourself so that you know if something should occur and they somebody's asking you about that funding, you know where to go to get that information. So again, talking about what are you proposing to do? You know, it's important to do research and looking at evidence based interventions and how they worked in other facilities or settings to address your specific root causes. Um, focusing on quality improvement activities that will increase the effectiveness of the care you deliver without increasing operational costs is always a good thing. Understanding how VBR um, may support the ongoing sustainability. Um, meaning that if you hire somebody in the direct care, so say I hire um, a CNA or whatever I want, an extra nurse, um, that those costs will be built in um, moving forward. So even when the project funding stops um, through BVR, you can continue with those positions because they're built into your rates. Um, and then investing in human and um, physical and human capital so that you can um, yield those benefits benefits beyond PIP um, and then choosing uh, the PIP project that's central to the mission and the organization. And, and it's a good thing to look around to see what other facilities have done. Also, what's a great thing to do is, is looking at what new technology is out there. We've had lots of PIPs coming in that are pretty innovative, um, that are using a lot of technology out there. But looking at different technology and bringing technology into to the facilities, um, there's the safe being people have used. Um, there's um, a couple other things that people have used and sometimes that technology can become frustrating, but that's OK um, because we need to let these people into the facilities with their technology so we can see what meets our needs and what doesn't meet our needs. Examples of some resources, you know, looking at consultants, staffing positions, education, what education we're going to provide. That's a huge deal when we're doing this, um, making sure that we are educating our staff. Um, hiring of positions, tools, materials, web based education, certifications. Um, you know, this is a good place to get funding to have people certified and in infection control and activities. Um, those things all count towards this. Um, updating your software, um, getting new software in. We do that too. Equipment, you know, laptop, iPads, iPad, iPods. Um, a lot of people have um, find things like um, it's never too late um, that's been in there um, virtual 
um, reality. That's been another thing that people have been using too um, in projects. Um, so there's lots of things that are out there. And so we keep that in mind when we're thinking about that problem that we identified. And most important, keep in mind these costs would be reflected in the rate increase. So that's why it's important that we include these things in this section so that when we're looking at that rate increase, we can say, oh yeah, we know that they needed $200,000 to do that because you know we're, they're, they have consultants, they have education and they're, you know, they're um, buying equipment and those types of things. So section six um, references for project success. That's always important to put that in here to provide a list of the websites that you're going to use. Um, cite them for your proposal. Um, and I did include in the um, in the instructions too on the back page. There's some reference material there too um, that you can look at some different sites. I also, when you're working on a project, um, I am open to review your RFP. I am not part of the selection committee. I can help you um, review your data, um, maybe look, um, talk about what you want to do, if that's a good fit, and help find resources um, for projects that you want to do. I do have a lot of resources. And then section seven, this is the performance measures. And so this is really important too. This and um, when you're looking at this, what are you gonna what are you gonna measure? Where are those problem areas? Um, and you want to include that in um, in here. And so I gave an example of using the quality indicator um, for depression. You put in the baseline, you put in the target um, that you want to improve by, and then the time frame. So when you want that to end. And I also included in here the quality of life. So you can see too, the quality of life is done yearly. Um, so when you're reading these instructions, and if you go in there, it'll explain a little bit more about how you want to look at those timelines and when you want that project to start. So. So the proposals um, should address topics where the baseline data supports the topic of the problem area. Existing collaborative or chain organizations may submit more than one proposal, which splits member facilities into groups that share common problem areas. Facilities are highly encouraged to choose valid outcome measures, such as those on the Minnesota report card. Projects relying on process measures um, as a means of determining achievement Project goals will be less competitive. Examples are um, the count of employees, training, those types of things. And then DHS will determine the collaborative project outcome and performance based on a combination of individual performance and average collaborative performance. For example, each provider participating in a collaborative project will have an, uh, uh, a risk portion tied to that collaborative average performance as well as a risk portion tied to their own performance measures. So when, if you're doing a collaborative project, you can have a collaborative goal and then you can have individual goals too, or you can just have individual goals and you don't need to have a, a collaborative goal. If you have a collaborative goal and individual facility goals, you're splitting it's half and half. So half of the funding is at risk um, for the collaborative and half of the funding is, is at risk for individual facilities. For section eight, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, who's going to talk about the rate increase and the payment calculator. Thank you, Kim. You will see in section eight, there still is a, a rate increase of how much you think you're going to need to achieve your goal for your PIP proposal. So you're going to have, of course, you're going to think you need a one year or a two year, and then a percentage per year, and then the dollar amount for your facility. And we do that by we have a calculator that you can use incentive payment calculator and I'm going to bring that up now so you can see the, exactly how it's going to work. All right, so we are looking at the sheet here. If I put an IID number in here, which uh, I'm going to use blurred out. This is a, a fake facility here and let's just say, for example, the weighted operating rate is 30111. But let's just say we're, we're playing around here and just say your facility needs about $100,000 to do your project. So 95, kind of play the numbers a little bit, right? You have 2.11, so you're right at $100,000 right here. So this is what you need for either one or two years, depending on your facility, what your goals are going to be. And it all calculates for you. So this is going to be what you would put into your application. 
Now do keep in mind that down below there is a number of beds, so the number of beds could change. So if I do have 48 beds here, if all of a sudden I have 45 beds, you'll see you're going to have to match the beds by after September 30th, and this one says 2020. It could be 2021, 2022, whichever year that we're in for PIP, we will modify it and let you know on this sheet which year you need to have that bed count. That way uh, it, it'll be different every year, but just keep an eye on that, that uh, annotation. Which is what your rate is based on. So you'll have to put a date that's after that date. If you did 9-1-2020, it'll give you a error message that it's before October 1, right? So let's just say you had it on 11-1-2020. Boom, there it is. Now your number went down. So you can see your number is no longer the 100,000 here. It's now 94 because your bed count changed. So you'll have to bring the numbers up a little bit in the section up here. So we're going to play a little bit here. So let's say 2.1, 2.21. 2.25 all right so there we're back 2.25 they had to go up a little bit because your beds went down so you can see how that that works here let's just say for example you went up in beds so opposite direction now your numbers have gone higher so even though we might have been at low twos earlier now we got to bring it down to the ones because the numbers went went down a bit so we're going to go 1.80 98 one and just kind of play around with the numbers. This is kind of the only way to have fun with this. 82, 1.83, and then we are probably there at 1.84. And there's our 100,000. So it went down a bit, your percentage, because your beds went up. So this is going to be your new number. If you had no bed change, then you can just keep it right where it's at. And this is your number for getting your numbers. Calculate your, your final budget here. So that's how you use the form. This will be available to you to use. And uh, good luck. Back to Kim. OK, thanks, Dave. A good place to look at um, prior projects um, is on our website for the PIP. Um, each project's um, each round has the project summaries in there, as you can see, all the way down to eight. It's really good to look at this because this gives you ideas of what other facilities have done. It gives you a description of their project. It gives you their goals that they're working on, and it also shows you the amount of funding that they're receiving, the percentage of funding. So it's a good place to go in there um, and look and see what's available, I mean, what other people have done. And then also, if you'd like to speak with those facilities, I can um, um, hook you up with them and they can talk um, about their project and what, how it's going and how it's working and share um, resources. So the RFP, checklist I put in here too. Um, this is what the selection committee is looking for when they look at your RFP. So it's good to look to keep in mind these bullet points here. You know, does the proposal clearly outline those key elements necessary for successful quality improvement project? Because that's what this is. Does it clearly identify and prioritize key concerns? Does the proposal, does the proposed project interventions and resources align with identified key concerns? And then are the goals outlined in the proposal measurable and reliable? Is the proposed rate increase reasonable with the scope and complexity of the project? Is the project proposed innovative in its approach? Is the project designed to be sustainable in long term? And then are the strategies proposed in the project able to be replicated and shared with other facilities? That's really key and really important. Um, those strategies that you write and those resources that you put in these proposals, we do use some of those for um, sharing with other facilities. And so that's important that whatever you're doing, that looking at that too, can we share this with other facilities? That's really helpful. And then timelines and notification letters for timelines, you know, you really need to look at um, the request for proposal because that's where it's going to give you that submission date, um, deadline, um, the selection process um, and the notification letters. So, you know, refer back to that um, document. All proposals will receive a, a notification letter from DHS. So even if you don't make it, we still send a letter, so everybody gets a letter. Whoever submits a proposal will receive a notification letter. 
And then that's the other thing too, is, is you'll find that timeline in the request for proposal document. And then projects selected will be um, contacted to set up the date and time for um, negotiations. And then it's important to note too, that in some, in most cases, expect changes to the project um, following the negotiations. Like maybe we look at the length or maybe we look at what your resources, maybe there's not enough in there. Maybe you need to provide more information. Um, and then that, uh, that um, rate increase, maybe that rate increase is too much money um, and it's not, um, it's not reflective in what you're what you put in section five. And then also the performance targets, you know, those performance targets, because we have this due earlier um, than this project starts, um, sometimes those can change. And so when we're doing negotiations, we always look at to the current data. And then in some rare cases, we'll ask you to even change your focus of the project um, because maybe we see an area where you're performing really, really poorly um, and that really needs to have something done and we will um, suggest that you do that. Um, so sometimes we do change the direction of that project too. And that's it. So if you have any questions um, at all regarding the RFP um, and for the rate calculator, you know, Dave is available to answer those questions. If you have any questions regarding this RFP at all, um, you need assistance in preparing a review, or I can review your proposal too and send back um, input. I'm available to do that too. So that's the end of completing the RFP. And for those of you um, who want to stay on, I was, I'll do a quick review of the data DHS generates um, for the rest of the session. I'm gonna do a quick overview of the DHS data for those of you who are new to PIP. Um, DHS generates data and manages the provider portal and the nursing home report card. Most of the above data is found on the Minnesota report card. So you can see on this slide here that we have the quality indicators, we have the hospitalization data, um, the community discharge, resident quality of life, family survey, short stay, and then the QUIP program. This is all housed in the provider portal. And then we have the Minnesota report card, which is a separate entity. And we'll talk about that for um, at the end of the slides. So here is the um, address to link to the portal. Um, each facility has a username and password. Um, DHS is only allowed to give that login information to the facility administrator. Um, and the administrators can contact Beverly Malatsky or you can tell, um, send me a quick email and I can forward it to Bev too if you forget. But it, the, the email you send has to come from the administrator of the facility. We are not allowed to give it to director of nursing or anybody else. All right, so now I'm going to talk about um, the Minnesota quality indicators. So here's what the front page or copy of the Minnesota quality indicators, and I just wanted to talk about this quickly. DHS runs these quality indicators in a four quarter um, rolling average. Okay, so when you're looking at this report, this is four quarters of information. So it's a year's worth of information. And we do this so that you can see the trending in your facility. So if you look at the top here, it tells you, you know, the facility score on a 100 point scale. So we measure on a 100 point scale. And then the state average, the rank where your facility ranks. And then over here on the far right is if there's any missing QIs and then the number of missing domains, which isn't really um, that only happens in like where you have a smaller facility and sometimes there's not enough residents to generate any information for that um, indicator and so it will be zero. And so if you see on the left side, you have the domains um, that are listed here. And for psychosocial, there's two domains. I mean, there's two indicators um, and each indicator is worth five points in, in psychosocial. So for the domains, I'll step back a minute. Each domain is worth 10 points, okay? But for each domain is also separated and how, depending on how many indicators are in that domain is, is how many points it, it's worth. And so there's two 
indicators in this domain. So each domain, I mean, each indicator is worth five points. Then we have the observed score. So this is the scores that are generated before DHS risk adjusts the scores. And then we have the facility risk adjusted score. And then we have the state average. And then we have the ranking. So for this indicator at the top here, um, incidence of worsening behaviors, you can see that the risk adjusted score is 24.62% and the state average is 10 percent in this facility ranks out of 349 facilities they rank 337 um, the the then you have the rate for full points and you have the rate for no points so if this facility were to make 4.62 percent or lower they would get the full five points then for the points for no points if they make 19.90 percent or above they get zero points. And as you can see, our score is 24.62. So we get zero points and we get a sad face. So this would be an area if I was looking to see if I was looking at a quality improvement project, this might be an area where I want to um, where I want to work on um, in, in improving. And then you have um, the depression. So you can see here on depression on depression, you almost got all points. Um, so your score is 2.52, um, the state average is 4.41, you rank 140 out of 348, but when you look at the full points, you're still above the 1.02%. So you get four points for this, um, for depressive symptoms. The other thing too is, is that we also included in here the short stay. I'm not going to talk about the, that though too, but the in short stays are included in these Minnesota um, indicators too. They follow it. Next, we have the quality of life survey. It's important to look at the survey too when you're um, looking at areas of weakness and hopefully you're including the survey in your um, QI meeting. Um, um, to see where the facility is ranking. This survey is done once a year. Vital research comes into the facility um, and they interview residents. And then they also at that time send out the family um, survey, mail those out too. And so you can see here up at the top, um, they give the observed um, scores and then the risk adjusted. And then the overall percentage is given there too. And then each domain is listed. And so when you go down here, you can see how you're ranking, you know, like you're doing well, you're over the state average with activity domain. You can still do better, but you are above the state average there. And when you're looking at the food domain, you can see you're at 72% and the state average is at 75. And you can think, hmm, what's going on with the food? And then you have the environment dignity all the way down to mood and then it gives the overall score at the bottom and you can see your score is 6.26 and the state average is 6.34 that much off of that so when you're looking at the score and you look at this food domain and you're thinking okay what's going on here or any of these that are ranking below the state average then you can go to um, the the um, the questions and that's on the observed report and so next we're going to look at the observed report so on this report, it's important that you look at this observed report too, because it holds a lot of information about how many residents were surveyed in the facility and also gives you the state average of how many um, surveys were done. And so overall throughout the state, so that's good information to have. So when we're looking at food enjoyment, we can come down here and see there's four questions and we'd look to see, well, what's going on here? And so we can see that it says, do you like the food here? So 18 residents responded and these are always in a positive and 83.3% uh, um, give the positive results. And last year you can see, or not last year, in 2019, it was 81.8. So you think, okay, so they like the food here. And then you look down to the next one. Do you get your favorite food here? And this is where you can start to see where your score is going down. Out of those 18 residents, 
we're positive about that, where last year or in 2019, 50 percent were. So this would be an area that you start to look at. You know, do we ask residents what their favorite foods are? Do we make those foods here? Um, this would be um, an area where you could focus on. The next thing, too, is, is that does that menu change en enough? When you're looking at, you can see here, um, the score is dropped from 2019. So these two areas here might be areas where you want to look at and making some change for residents. When you're looking at this food domain too, I would also go back to the quality um, indicators and see what's happening with weight loss and seeing if there's a correlation between the food enjoyment and weight loss too. And if there is, there may be a problem there um, where maybe we want to start looking at favorite foods for those people that are at risk and making sure that we provide that for them and becoming more um, resident centered. This information is also found on the Minnesota report card. So um, all of this information that we talk about is, is found there too. And then just quickly, we have um, the Family Satisfaction Survey. This survey also goes out at the time that Vital Research comes into your facility. So when Vital Research enters your facility, they also mail out these family surveys. And Vital Research also follows up with a phone call um, to any of those unanswered surveys. And then the these results too are shown on the Minnesota Report Card. The same thing with your short stay experience. Um, these are participants with um, 30 days or less that are identified on the MDS and Vital Research mails out surveys starting each January. So right now Vital Research is um, sending out those surveys and those results are shown on the Minnesota report card. And you can see too what they're looking at, admissions, clinical care, therapy, assistance, communication. Um, dining. If I'm looking for, uh, I'm, I'm going to have a surgery and I'm looking for some place to rehab, these are the, this is going to be what I'm going to zero in on when I'm looking at that Minnesota report card. And then we also have the hospitalization data. So we're looking at the short stay hospitalization. So we're looking at that rate within 30 days, how many people were readmitted back to the hospital. We're looking at long stay, how many res residents are um, admitted um, after. Um, 100 days and then the short stay and and long stay community discharges all important information too and this may be some place that you want to look at for doing a project and then we come to the minnesota report card <clears throat> nursing home report card and we have updated this i don't know how many of you go on here but you should go on here it has a lot of information regarding your facility and facilities surrounding you so i would Putting in the search engine now gives you the long stay search and the short stay. So if I'm somebody that's looking for a facility, I know that I'm going to have to rehab in. I would do this short stay search um, and pull up the data to see how the nursing home is doing. The same thing if I'm looking for some place for my parent to go, I'm looking for a long term nursing home. This is what I would pull up. And then once you pull this up, you can compare nursing homes in the surrounding area. So it's really important that you pay attention to that nursing home report card and what um, and what the outside public is seeing, you, just like you would with the CMS um, compare. And so when you're looking at the long stay, they use the five star rating and we look at the Minnesota qual uh, quality indicators. We're looking at um, the, the quality of life survey, the family survey, the state inspection results are there. Um, the hours of direct care staff, um, staff retention numbers are there, temporary pools usage and proportions of bed. And so there's a lot of information that you could be using to, to be um, doing a PIP. Um, we could be looking at doing maybe a staff retention um, or you know, along with pool uses to decrease that pool. This is where you could find um, the scores for that. And that's the quick overview um, of the data. And then the last slide is the context for questions regarding DHS data. So for portal, again, um, would be 
Dov Malatsky. I included her email address here. If you want any assistance with data, how to interpret it, how to do request analysis, you can certainly um, contact me and I can help you with that. And any technical issues that you find, um, you can contact Teresa Lewis. Um, technical issues being too that your numbers aren't coinciding, um, what you have and your data uh, um, is showing and it's not reflecting in DHS, you can contact Teresa and um, she's more than happy to help with that too. And that concludes my quick overview of filling out the um, the form, um, the, the, the fillable form for the RFP and the quick overview of the data that we have that you can use doing your PIP. Um, and if you have any questions, please again, feel free to contact me or Dave. Thanks. This is a bonus section going over the optional budget. Now, this is, of course, just for your internal use only. Now, we did a lot of work on this. You guys contributed to this, so I want to make it available to you if it would help you with your PIP. So you're welcome to use it if you'd like to. So here's a crash course on how to use this budget that's available. So let's just say you have you're going to create your budget for your facility. And again, you can unlock this. This is locked here, so you can't mess with this, but you can unlock it with DHS PIP up here at the tip password if you'd like to go to the format and unprotect it. But if not, I'll just kind of walk you through this quickly. Education topics and new hires. You can see that we actually have built into the equation some things that will help you. Um, we have benefits built in. We also have a cost of living benefit built in with the benefits for year two. So that'll help out a little bit. So let's just play fast and loose for a second. If the average wage, let's just play with the numbers here. We're going to say three. We're going to say seven hours and you're going to say there's five staff, right? It's going to calculate for you the benefits and the salary for those people. And let's just say that's the same for year two. So we're going to walk down the list. We have 30 hours, maybe a little less for year two, and we'll have the same amount of staff, right? So we'll have that on there. So it calculates the numbers automatically in, in for your training, whatever you need to do and your nurse supervisor, your coordinator, different, and you can add more people in here if you'd like. It, it will just tabulate for you so you can copy it down. But if you did that at the budget summary at the beginning, it will bring those numbers over. So if it does help at all, you can have that in there. Travel and conferences, you're going to go on a trip for something. You got your flight, you got your conference fee, you got your lodging, which was another, say, $150. You got your meals, $50. You got your mileage and you're going to be driving a little bit there. So it's going to be 80 miles. So and it calculates the uh, 58 and a half cents per mile and therefore you're already. So it just kind of gives you a quick estimate of what it would be. And you're going to do the same trip for several for both years. You're going to send staff several for two years. You know, you can always have it for year one, put that down for year two, 84, 680, go back to your summary and it's going to put it in there for you. So that that'll pop right in there. And we have equipment needs. Uh, education topics, we had your new hires as well. I didn't mention that before you. If you have a new hire, you're going to bring in somebody. Uh, you're going to bring in one more person. The average you have your their average salary. Let's just say it's put it at put it at the same number at 30 and we had dementia training. Um, they're going to be working on anything you do. It's going to bring over for within your costs in the front sheet, right? Travel and conferences, we did that one. Equipment needs, whatever you're going to buy, you're going to buy some weighted blankets, you right? You need, you're going to need 30 of them, right? And they're $100 a piece. Bingo, it's going to bring it out to $30. You're going to do some iPads for year two. Let's say they're $500 each. Or, I'm sorry, you're going to need 10 of them, and they're $500 each. Boom, there's your 5,000 budget summary. It brings it over for three and five. Uh, consulting fees, let's just say you're going to hire a consultant for year one uh, and year two. 10,000, play some numbers here, ding, it adds up there. Training and development, you can have your people here. It automatically adds in benefits. We did a 0 0.302. We also added a cost of living increase for year two. Let's just say you're going to have your 15 employees, hourly rate, and you, know, you can play around with this for all your different people. Departments for your internal work, right? Uh, if you need to label departments on there and it calculates for you the total, you go back to the budget summary and it brings it to the front page. Uh, PIP committee meeting, same thing, right? You can bring in your people, the people and what you're going to do, and then it's going to tabulate it for you. So number of employees, you're going to have 10 in that meeting, hourly rates at 30, 
departments internally for whatever you need to do. For PIP committee meetings, let's say you're gonna do one hour a week, uh, one hour maybe bi-weekly for year two. So you have an hourly rate of $30. You have two staff members, you know, in different areas, and it's gonna calculate their hourly meeting, right? For for per week for year one, uh, bi-weekly for year two. And and that's kind of how we calculate these out. 52, you know, divided by 26, give it a little cost of living increase for year two. So just these are just kind of fast and loose, showing you how it works. And then when it's all done, you can kind of get a tab tabulation, you know, of what you would need for your budget for a facility. So again, this is not due. Uh, you don't got to turn this in, but if it helps you at all, please use it. You know, if you have get questions on it, let us know. But that's for an individual facility budget. If it helps at all, we do have a collaborative budget that if you're going to use this one as well, the first thing I would always do is, you know, you have facility one. Let's just say you're going to have happy homes. Right, and then you're going to have Glacier Falls. If you do those, if you can label all the facilities, it's set up to tabulate to every single one of them is going to give you those titles. So Happy Homes, Glacier Falls is going to go down every single tab. So if the collaborative budget, again, this is going to tabulate from what you're working on. So the same thing before, let's just say you're going to have an expense for a, a, a collaborative. You have a fee of some kind. You're going to hire a consultant, right? It's $5,000. $5,000. You go to the main page, it's going to calculate it for you in the collaborative or the consultant fees you're going to have. Project supplies, same thing. You're going to have a weighted blanket. Let's say you're going to have an iPad. Um, the Happy Homes, they're going to need a bunch of iPads and it's going to cost $3,000. Then same thing. Glacier Falls maybe has more people, so they need $5,000 for theirs. So and not $55,000, there we go. And then you go back to the collaborative budget, it's gonna go down any facility that you do. So really just kind of walk down the list, um, education and they need to do for facility equipment needs. You can tabulate all those. Um, new hires, again, we tried to add with benefits in there, 0 0.302, just some numbers that we came up with, it might help 302 and a cost of living increase. Um, again, for the year two, putting it in there. So if you want to have, and again, it'll tabulate through everything you did. You can go back to the beginning, right? And your collaborative budget will give you a total for each facility that you're working on for a collaborative. So again, these are just tools that you're welcome to use. This is not required, but uh, we just thought maybe it would help out if you had this as a bonus. So.